even if you had not spent the past two days at this conference and seen a little bit of this gentleman who's speaking next, uh, 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 an old or maybe not so old guru, as he was characterized yesterday, uh, in, in the uh, discipline of social marketing, you would know about Doug McKenzie Moore. For more than two decades, he's been in the forefront of uh, both uh, thinking about and teaching and, uh, and, and uh, supporting the application of, of, of science to, to behavior change, most especially uh, his reputation has been made in the conservation and sustainability space. And in his presentation to us this afternoon, he's going to be talking to us about sustainable behavior change and community programs. Doug, I welcome you to the podium. Good? Okay, great, thank you. All right, so start again. Like most of you, my wife and I love chocolate, but there's a really important difference between Sue and I with respect to chocolate. Sue has restraint, of which I have absolutely none. My wife is capable of buying a bar of chocolate, taking off a couple pieces, eating them, and then putting the rest of the bar away. And then she'll come back the next day and eat a couple more pieces, put the bar of chocolate away, and this goes on the remainder of the week. This is what she was able to do before she married me. Because of my lack of restraint with respect to chocolate, for the previous part of my life before I married my wife, I simply didn't buy chocolate. I knew that I would eat all of it. So as soon as my wife and I got married and she would leave chocolate someplace in her house, I would go and search it out and I'd eat the remainder of it. <laughs> it didn't take very long to realize that that just was not going to work out well for us too in terms of our relationship. So, probably within the first two or three months of us being married, I said to Sue, you know, I can't ask you not to buy chocolate. You know, obviously that's your right to do that. But if you're gonna buy chocolate and it's gonna be in our house, what I will ask you to do is would you please hide it? <laughs> now the problem with asking Sue to hide chocolate, well there's three problems really. The first is, is that her motivation to hide chocolate was always surpassed by my motivation to find it. <laughs> Secondly, if you think about anyone's home, there's a finite number of places in anyone's home in which chocolate can be hidden. The image I want you to have in your mind right now is perpetual Easter egg hunt, all right? <laughs> and this went on for, my wife and I next week will have been married 25 years, this went on for a couple decades in our home. And the problem with, you know, finite number of places to hide chocolate in anyone's home is that my wife would hide the chocolate without replacement. Now, if you don't have a background in probability theory, what that means is that my wife would never cycle back to the places that she'd hid chocolate in the past. So the number of places in which I had to look for the chocolate was always diminishing. It was always getting smaller and smaller and smaller. After a certain period of time, my wife literally just gave up. You know, she knew that I was going to find the chocolate literally. It just wasn't worth her while to actually hide it. So as a social marketer, I started thinking not about the programs I help other people deliver for others, I started thinking about our own household and what kind of behavioral change strategy might I put in place that might be more likely to work in our own household. So I came home one afternoon, I had this box under my arm and I went into my wife's office, she was working at her computer and she said to me, what's that? And I said to her, this is my social marketing chocolate bar retention strategy. <laughs> <laughs> My wife had this look on her face at the time, which I expect many of you have seen from your own partners, of do you really want to do whatever you're about to do next? <laughs> so I pulled out of this box an electronic safe. <laughs> and I said to her, what I want you to do from this point forward is to put your chocolate into this safe. You're the... <laughs> You're the only person who's actually going to know the combination to the safe in the family, all right? I won't know. We've got a safety deposit box. Our important papers are there. This is a chocolate safe. <laughs> My wife's immediate question was, how much did you buy, spend buying that safe? To which I said, I'll tell you in a moment, but I first <laughs> want you to work through return investment with me. So I said to Sue, how many bars of chocolate do you think on an average week? And my wife said to me, Probably three, because you eat most of it. How many bars of chocolate did you think that you bought before you married me? 
usually probably about one. How much does a bar of chocolate that you buy cost you? She said roughly $2.50. So my wife's really smart, and I said, okay, so how much money are we spending as a family over the course of the year for you to buy three bars of chocolate? So that's $7.50 a week times 52. She does the math, it's $390. So I said to her, now I'll tell you how much that safe cost. <laughs> The safe cost, $130. What's the length of time that it'll take us to actually pay back that safe? My wife does the calculations. She says that has a return on investment of four months. So why am I telling you the story? I'm telling you the story because often when we think about designing programs to facilitate changes in behavior, we select, as I did initially, the wrong tool. Or if we select the right tool, we're often not using those tools in the most effective ways to facilitate changes in behavior. So in my comments this afternoon, I want to focus very specifically on just one topic. What tools should we be using and what circumstances? And then in addition to that, what does social science have to say about how best to utilize those tools? I mean, one of the things that I've been really pleased with over the last two decades is increasingly there's more and more utilization of tools coming from social sciences and particularly psychology. What I and people like Wes Schultz have been less pleased with is often those tools are used in ways that is not as appropriate as it could be. And if we do a better job of utilizing those tools well, we're almost certainly going to be more effective in bringing about changes in people's behavior. So what I want to do this afternoon is I want to start off by contextualizing my comments within a framework that I call community-based social marketing. Community-based social marketing is a term that I started to use in the early 1990s to talk about a merger between the field that all of you know is social marketing, which, as you know, had been in the early 1990s, been mostly exclusively applied to health-related behavioral changes, workplace safety, traffic safety, et cetera, with knowledge coming from psychology and trying to merge together those two areas. And there's some real core lessons that come from psychology that I think can make the delivery of behavioral change programs more effective. Community-based social marketing, as you can see on the screen, is based upon five steps. The first of these steps is very, very careful selection of which behaviors we're going to go after. So I'll give you one example of that. If we think about trying to promote residential energy use, as Tom mentioned, most of my work is in the environmental field. If we think about trying to promote residential energy use, for example, in North America, there are over 240 discrete behaviors that we might ask people to engage in. They can't all be equivalent with one another. So the first step of community-based social marketing is to take a long list of possible behavioral candidates and call that down to a shorter list. How do we do that? There's three things I want to suggest that we want to rigorously look at. First of all, and not surprisingly, what's the impact of each of those behavioral requests we might make of someone? So how does a programmable thermostat compare to installing complex fluorescent light bulbs? How does that compare to asking people to utilize smart strips? or take shorter showers, which means they're heating their water less. Each of those behaviors that we might ask people to engage in have their own impacts that are associated with them. And most of the time, most of the programs that get delivered do just that. They look at the impacts, they look for the highest impact behaviors, and that's what they go after. And that's a mistake. Canada's national social marketing campaign to try to get Canadians to be more energy efficient and to try to get them to change their transportation habits, something called the one-ton challenge, chose behaviors that had very high impacts. Additional insulation in people's attics, taking out their old furnaces, and replacing with energy efficient furnaces. So what's the problem with that? The behaviors that they were going after had very low probabilities of people engaging in them. So we want to look at impact, but we want to also combine that with probability. What's the actual likelihood that we can get people to adopt these behavioral changes? And of course, those probabilities will differ based upon the kinds of programs that we put in place. But it's not just impact, and it's not just probability. It's also penetration. What are people currently doing? We're literally looking for high impact, high probability, low penetration behaviors. And we can solve that as an equation. And there are many examples now nationally, sorry, internationally, of people doing exactly that. They're starting off their environmental behavioral change programs by asking, what's the impact, what's the probability, and what's the penetration? And they're taking long lists of behaviors that they could go after, and they're culling them down to shorter lists. Once we've got that shorter list of what I call tier one behaviors, then the second thing is to try to uncover the barriers and the benefits that are associated with those tier one actions. Now, this is one thing I really would like to ask you to note. We know conclusively now 
that the barriers differ from behavior to behavior to behavior. Even within a domain like waste reduction or energy efficiency or transport, the barriers to getting someone to walk to school are completely different from the barriers of getting them to bike to school. And if we don't understand what the differences are between those behaviors in terms of the barriers, we have a much reduced likelihood of actually changing behavior. The other thing I'd like to ask you to note is with expected benefits. We often make the mistake of assuming that the reasons why we're delivering a program are the same reasons why people would want to engage in the behavioral change. We talk about impacts, the reasons why we're delivering our programs, and we try to encourage people to engage in the behavioral change based upon the impact. Again, Canadian example, we called our national campaign to reduce energy use, to reduce uh, alter transportation habits from the residential sector, the one-ton challenge. We damned that program from the moment we named it by imagining that the principal reason why Canadians would engage in those actions was to reduce CO2. We needed to first look and find out what are their principal motivations and make sure that our programs were speaking to them. So impacts and benefits are often two different things. And we need to make sure that we don't assume that they're the same. So second step, uncover the barriers and benefits doing all the audience research that you and I are very familiar with. Third step, not surprisingly, is to develop strategies to reduce the barriers to people engaging in behavioral change, and at the same time, try to enhance their benefits or motivations to want to engage in that action. But simultaneously, we want to also try to drive up the barriers to the behavioral change that we'd like to discourage, and we'd like to try to reduce the benefits or motivations that go along with that. So Toronto, for example, has a very effective mass transit system. Some of you maybe, their visitors have had a chance to use it over the last several days. But if they didn't take actions to make single occupant driving more challenging, people still would have chosen single occupant driving. So if you go to, for example, the um, Sky Dome to watch baseball, or you go to the Rogers Center to watch basketball, for example, either of those cases, you're going to find that there's virtually no parking close to either of those centers. They're forcing people to move towards the behavior that we wish to encourage by looking at both the action they wish to discourage as well as the action that they'd like to encourage. Fourth, we want to pilot test our programs. We want to make sure on a small scale that we're delivering programs, and we want, whenever possible, to make sure that our measures are not based upon self-report. Many times, we utilize self-report as a way to try to measure whether or not our programs are successful. One of the problems with self-report is what in the literature are called Hawthorne effects. When people know that we're measuring and monitoring what they're doing, they may change their behavior just simply based upon that knowledge. So if we're doing a pilot in which relying upon self-report measurements as our indices of whether the program's working effectively and our program does work effectively, we won't know. Is this self-report, the strategy that we put in place, or some combination of those two things? And some of you might be thinking, who cares? I mean, if we're getting the behavioral change, that's what we're really interested in. The reason why we have to care is when we go from the pilot to the fifth step of broad scale implementation, we're often not observing people, and people know that. And if observations was an important part of why people changed the behavior in the first place, we've confounded the results of a pilot. Now, this is a pretty linear process, but built into this are two feedback loops. The first is here. You selected the behaviors carefully, you've done the bearing benefit research, you then have to have what I like to call an avuncular chat with yourself, in which you're saying, can I actually address the barriers and benefits that I've identified for this behavior? And if the answer is no, then we need to cycle back to the first step and select another behavior, because your program's gonna fail, even when you go on to the pilot. The second place in which we might go backwards is at the fourth step. You piloted the program, you've delivered it, it hasn't worked effectively. Or we obviously would think about revising the program, redelivering it. If it's still not working effectively, we're gonna slide back to the first step and select another behavior. Now, what I wanna to suggest to you is that we need to use this process for each and every behavior that we wanna go after. And the rationale reason for that is that barriers are often so clearly different from one another that if we don't understand the barriers, the likelihood that we can develop effective programs drops dramatically. Now, many of you working in the health field know that already. But in the environmental field, there's a, for most many people, there's an understanding that the barriers are a belief that the barriers are consistent across different actions. And they believe that they can come up with a uniform strategy to get people to make their homes more energy efficient. And not surprisingly, the programs aren't very effective. The last thing before I get into other content is that when we think about this process, 
We need to do the bearing benefit research for each action. That does not mean that we have to deliver community-based social marketing programs for one behavior at a time. We can bundle together behaviors, and often in doing that, our programs become more cost-effective. How many behaviors might we go after possibly at one time? Probably no more than five or six. There's an emerging literature around what's called decision fatigue. And I want to put this in quotes because it is an emerging literature. Well, I, you know, I can't say there was a tremendous confidence, but it is looking that if we ask people to do more than five or six things at a time, they will do less rather than more. But for each of the behaviors we go after and that group of five or six actions, we need to understand something fundamentally about the barriers, the motivations for that action, and we need to have literally a strategy that helps us to facilitate overcoming the barriers and motivating people to act. So for those of you who'd like to read more about this, um, I've got some copies of my book with me, and I'm going to do something that's social marketing based. If you will commit, I've got 32 copies sitting up under the chair here. If you will commit to read the book, and then once you've read the book, pass it on to someone else, and ask them to make a commitment to read the book and pass it on to someone else, I will give you a copy for free, all right? So at the end of the workshop, after the second person, the third person has spoken, please come and see me. Now, if you think about community-based social marketing, the third step here is critical in terms of thinking about selecting the right tools and making sure that we're utilizing them well. And I want to suggest to you that we've got a really wide range of tools that we can utilize. The concern that I have often is that people are utilizing tools just because they know about them, rather than whether or not they're really appropriate for the circumstance or situation. Commitment's a really good example of that. People have learned about commitments over the last decade. They're building them into programs without asking, is this an appropriate tool to use in this particular circumstance? So when we think about trying to enhance motivation, I want to suggest that these might be some of the tools we might think about. Now, this isn't an exhaustive list, but we might think about commitments, goal setting, norms, incentives. When we think about reducing barriers instead, here might be some of the tools we might focus on. We might think about prompts, incentives, convenience, feedback. Again, not an exhaustive list. Right? But our task for us to think about is when we've identified that we need to motivate people, or when we've identified barriers, we need to be thinking strategically what tools are going to best enable us to be able to do that. This afternoon, I'm going to speak to you about just three tools. There's many more covered in my book, and obviously many more in the broader literature. Talk with you about commitments, the use of prompts, and the use of norms. So let's talk about commitments first. Commitments, as you saw briefly on the screen there, in my mind are really designed to try to motivate people to act. And what you might want to jot down is I think of commitments as being a useful tool when people have an interest in the behavior, but they've not yet done it yet. And we can think about utilizing that tool to move from them from the point of being intentional to actually engaging the behavior often for the first time. It's also a very useful tool, interestingly, in the literature for repetitive behavioral changes. There's a number of studies that document that commitments can be used quite effectively to build the motivation sufficiently for a person to engage in behavior long enough that this new behavior now becomes habitual for them. So let me show you one case study, a project that I worked on that was delivered here in Toronto, and then I'm going to show you one case study, and then I'm going to show you or give you some examples of how I think we might most effectively use commitments. This is a project that was delivered first as a pilot here in Toronto. When we delivered it with um, some Toronto Transit Commission, what are called kiss and ride sites. These are locations in which people drop their partner off in the morning, they kiss them goodbye, hence the name, and then they take the train down to the downtown core and then pick up the subways or buses to go elsewhere to work in downtown Toronto. And this is a program that we delivered both at kiss and ride sites and also at schools. And in both locations, we wanted people to turn their vehicle engines off. Literature from Natural Resources Canada suggested any given time during our warmer months, we have about 56% of Canadians sitting in their cars with their engines idling and all the unnecessary pollution that goes along with that. So we did barrier and benefit research, focus groups that were done nationally as well as the National Telephone Survey. And then when we looked at the analysis for that National Telephone Survey, I did discriminant analysis to look at what distinguishes between people who are shutting their engines off and those who are not. And here's what we found. First of all, in terms of benefits, the principal reason why people would turn their engines off, as I alluded to earlier, had nothing to do with why we were funded to deliver this program. The program was funded to reduce carbon dioxide emissions, but when we looked at why people would turn their engines off, the principal motivation was enhance air quality. Now, I want to stress that to you, because we've talked a lot over the last couple of days about barriers. In my mind, benefits and motivation trump barriers. 
If we can't motivate people to act, as we heard in the last presentation, it doesn't matter what the barriers are. So we need to find ways first to be matching how are we gonna motivate people to act, and then we have to find ways to be able to strip away their barriers. We found three very distinct barriers. First, people simply forget. They're pulling into different locations. Child isn't out of school yet. They pull out their smartphone, they're texting, catching up on their email, reading the news, whatever, and they don't simply turn their engine off immediately. Secondly, Canadians believe that they should idle their car for longer than three minutes before it's more fuel efficient to turn their car off and restart it. And interesting, many of the anti-idling bylaws set the threshold at three minutes. And what they're inadvertently doing is teaching people that three minutes is the threshold. What we actually know from research done by Natural Resources Canada is if you're talking about Vox and NOx emissions, the threshold is 45 seconds. If we're talking about CO2, it's zero. People should turn their cars off immediately. But that's not what Canadians believe. Further, they believe that turning their car engine on and off repeatedly will hurt their starter. That was true when I learned to drive. It's not true today. Ford and other manufacturers have looked at this. It's a non-issue. So there's lots of barriers in which it's a perceived barrier rather than a real barrier. But nonetheless, we have to treat it as if it's a real barrier. So we put in place two different social marketing strategies. When we're thinking about developing pilots, we almost always want to test different strategies against each other to find which of those is most cost effective to bring about a behavioral change. And notice that I'm saying most cost effective. I'm not saying the largest behavioral change. We might be able to deliver a program that gets 50% of people to turn their vehicle engines off that costs us X. We might be able to deliver another program that gets 40% of people to turn their engines off, but it costs us half as much we take option B because we could deliver that to a much larger number of people. So we want to be looking at not just are we changing behavior, but are we doing that in the most cost-effective way. The only way that we can do that is if we're testing multiple strategies against each other. So what did we do? We randomly signed some schools in Toronto and some TTC kiss and ride sites into one of three conditions. A control condition, a condition which we used just signs because that would be the least costly thing that we could do. We knew the number one barriers that people were forgetting, so we put signs like the one you see on the left-hand side of the screen on sawed-off signposts. Why sawed-off signposts? Because when people are parked in their car and they're not moving, they can't see the sign. They'd have to see through the roof to be able to do that. So we lowered the height of the sign, sprinkled these signs throughout the parking lots. The signs by themselves have absolutely no impact on people turning their engines off. It would have been the most cost-effective thing for us to do, but it didn't work. In contrast, in the other condition, we're going to do something quite different. So let's imagine that Carol has a daughter. I don't know if she has a daughter or not, but let's imagine that she has a daughter. And I'm working with Toronto Public Health. We had a group of stakeholders that we were working with on delivering this program. Why did we choose Toronto Public Health? Because the number one benefit was enhancing air quality. So she's waiting to pick her child up from a local Toronto school. And she's sitting in her car. And whether she's idling or not, I come up to speak with her. And I'm wearing this t-shirt that says, I'm working with Toronto Public Health. And I literally point at the t-shirt and say, as you can see, I'm working with Toronto Public Health. Now, why am I doing that? Because I want her to associate what I'm about to say, a health-related message, with who this is coming from. Who's it coming from? A trusted agency in Toronto working on health issues. So I say to her, we're delivering a program to improve air quality for children at the school. Why is that the first thing we're saying? Because benefits trump barriers. If I can't motivate her to be interested in what I'm going to say subsequently, this is not going to be a strategy that's going to work effectively. So I say that to her. And then I say to her, I didn't know this until recently myself. I'm about to tell her two things that she probably doesn't know. And whenever there's a circumstance in which we do that, we risk the possibility that people will feel embarrassed. And in this case, it was true. I didn't know this until I did this research. So I said to her, we didn't know this until recently, but most Canadians believe that they should idle their car for longer than three minutes before it's more fuel efficient to turn their car off, to then turn the car off and then restart it. Natural Resources Canada has looked at this. The, what their suggestion is, is we turn cars off immediately. Further, turning your car on and off repeatedly will not hurt your starter. With a new car like you've got, major manufacturers like Ford have looked into this. It's a non-issue. So in these brief couple sentences, I've spoke to the most important benefit and we've addressed two of the barriers. I then say to her, would you be willing to turn your car off in the future? 
Now, when we had these conversations, both at the TTC Kiss and Ride sites as well as at the um, schools in Toronto, 82% of the people that we spoke to said that they'd be willing to do that. But that's the weakest type of commitment that we can seek. There's four types of commitments that we can use. We can use verbal commitments, we can use written commitments, we can use public commitments, and we can use public and durable commitments. And I'll give you an example of public and durable commitment in a moment. So I say to her, that's wonderful that you're willing to turn your ring off. We know that the principal reason why people don't do this is they simply forget. Would you be willing to put the sticker in the front windshield of your vehicle? So the sticker you see on the right-hand side of the screen, in real life, that's about this large. And I say to her, there's no adhesive on this. When we did research around this, people told us they wouldn't put the stickers on if they had adhesive on it. I said, this is a static link sticker. Would you please put it on your windshield? It'll remind you to turn your engine off, but it will also foster other parents and guardians turning their engines off as well. Now, the part that you can see on the screen is what people would see if they're looking from outside the car at the front of the car. We've made the back of the sticker purposely opaque so people can see through it and be reminded to turn their engine off. We have four different behavior change tools built into this small little sticker. It's a prompt to remind her to turn her engine off. It's a commitment, public and durable commitment, which we know drives ongoing habitual behavioral changes. It's also a matter of a form of fostering social diffusion by making a behavior visible in the community and getting parents and guardians talking about the importance of turning their engines off. And importantly, because we've made the behavior visible, it's also a way of facilitating what are called descriptive social norms. One of the real problems with many environment-related behaviors, as well as many health-related behaviors, is they happen in the privacy of people's homes and their businesses, and they cannot be witnessed by other people. Contrast that, for example, with curbside recycling, in which the very act of recycling is visible to other people and facilitates social diffusion and facilitates social norms. So we're trying to make this behavior visible. 26% of the people put the stickers on while we're there. Some other percentage would have done it afterwards. It took us about a minute to a minute and a half. We hired a bank of university students, and they found they could do a school in the course of two afternoons. The TTC and Kiss and Ride sites took longer. So what about the results? This is a huge data set, over 8,000 observations of people coming into these different parking lots. We have hidden people in cars, and they're unobtrusively measuring whether people are idling, and if they are idling, how long they're idling for. How are they doing that? They have clipboards on their lap with a whole bunch of stopwatches running across the top of it. So you come in and you park, I look to see, are you idling or not? If he is, I start the stopwatch and look to the next person, et cetera. So measuring two things, we got a 32% reduction in the number of vehicles idling. For those people who are still idling their vehicles, we nearly wipe out the behavior. We get a 73% reduction in the length of time that people are idling their cars for. It's as if people come in, they're momentarily distracted. Remember that they ought to be turning their engines off, and they turn their engines off much more quickly. Now, this is based or, or compared to a control group, so we know the results that we're seeing here are due to our actual program. This was then turned into by Natural Resources Canada under the wisdom of a woman named Catherine Ray, an anti-idling toolkit. And this toolkit was put up on the web. People could download this toolkit. We now have 200 Canadian communities they're delivering anti-idling programs based upon what we initially did here. And we have some eight countries around the world that are utilizing the same toolkit. So let's talk a little bit about how to effectively use commitments. First of all, they have to be voluntary. The literature is very clear about this. Commitments work because of self-perception. There's been two reviews of the commitment literature. Uh, perhaps the most important of that is this review that was done by Berger. And he found that of all the different potential reasons or explanations for why commitments work, self-perception is the most important. When someone chooses freely to engage in this action, they're likely to think back upon their behavior and see themselves as the type of person who believes that in fact it's important to turn their engine off. So they need to be voluntary. Next, we need to make our commitments public and durable whenever possible. Because public and durable commitments not only drive the behavioral change on the part of the person, but in addition to that, they drive behavioral changes on the part of other people. Early on in the literature related to commitments, people made use of commitments, but the commitments were almost always written or they were verbal commitments. And people are now realizing we can do some pretty interesting things with public and durable commitments. So let me show you a couple examples of that. This is a project that I worked on in Waterloo Region, just south of here, about 100 kilometers south of Toronto. 
And we had people go door to door and speak to people about the importance of reducing their exposure to pesticides. And if a household was willing to stop using pesticides, we said to them, that's great. Obviously, we would like to try to reduce pesticide exposure throughout this whole community. Would you be willing to allow us to put a sticker on the side of your recycling container? Now, these stickers in real life are about this large, and they're designed purposely to be about the size of a bumper sticker, so that when people are walking or biking or driving down the street, they can see what that sticker's about. That's an important element. If you don't have that, we're not likely to get social diffusion or social norms occurring. Now, some of you might be imagining, with all the different behavioral changes that we might be trying to foster, that someone's recycling container would eventually start to look a lot like a travel case with all these things sort of all over top of it, all right? Let me show you a really interesting example of this for Mandura, Mandura south of Perth. There's, by the way, probably three, 400 examples at least of people using commitment approaches like this for fostering different forms of sustainable behavior. This is a program you can see to reduce electricity. And there's a whole series of energy efficiency actions that they want people to engage in in Mandura. And as people engage in different actions, they put stickers over top of the initial sticker. So the sticker in real life is about this large, and then they superimpose over top of it other stickers until it finally fills in like this. Now, one of the things I think that they should have done, actually, is they should have showcased visually the actual behaviors so that people could just glance at it and say, well, the Mackenzie Moore is to put in programmable thermostat, or they're using complex fluorescent light bulbs. If we did that, it'd be even more intuitive for people to work out what other actions were people engaged in. So we want to make sure that they're voluntary, that they're public and durable. We also want to request callbacks. This is the work of Elliot Aronson. Aronson has done some of the best work in the field of social psychology related to environment-related behaviors. Aronson trained a bunch of auditors for Pacific Gas and Electric, largest utility in North America. And he trained them to really revamp the way in which they were doing their audits. And he said to them, what happens at the end of your audit when you're delivering an audit? And the person would say, well, we give a person a list of things that they can do. And they said, what do you do then? He said, well, we leave then. He said, I want you to stop doing that. What I want you to do instead is ask the person, of the things that are on this list, which of them are you most interested in? So let's imagine the person says, I think I'd like to weather step and call my house. You then say to them, that's great. When do you think you might get around to doing that? Now there's a, <laughs> can we get this uh, corrected, please? <laughs> Thank you. So I said to them, I want you to stop doing that. I want you to ask the person, when do you think you'll engage in this behavior? Now, there's emerging literature around implementation intentions, getting people to think about when they'll do something. That in and of itself has been interestingly shown to have some pretty substantive impacts upon people's behavioral choices and what they do. And here what we're doing is combining, essentially, an implementation intention with a commitment and with the knowledge of the person who's going to call back. So the person says, Jim says, you know, I don't think I'll weather strip and caulk this week, but I think I might get around to doing it next weekend. So I say, that's great. Would it be helpful to you if I gave you a call back around that time? He says, yeah, that'd be great. It's no additional cost for him to have the call back. Many people took him up on this. What did Aronson find? Three to four times as many people retrofitted their homes with the knowledge the person would be calling them back. Right? It's a really simple thing for us to be thinking about building into our programs. Right? Now, finally, we do not want to pair commitments with incentives. That happens very frequently, where people utilize commitments and they have a draw or something that someone can get engaged in. Why do we not want to do that? Incentives provide external justification for someone engaging in the behavior, and they undermine self-perception, which drives commitments. So we want to make sure that when we're utilizing commitments, we're not coupling them with incentive-based programs. It's not an argument against using incentives, it's an argument against using incentives along with commitments. Next behavior change tool. Prompts. I'm going to give you another example close to home here. This is a project that was delivered by a man named Glenn Pleasance. Glenn is the water efficiency coordinator in Durham region. And Glenn delivered a community-based social marketing program, and he compared it to the traditional information intensive programs that many municipalities deliver. What Glenn did is he selected three communities, North York, just to the north of where we are right now, Durham region, just to the east, and Halton region, just to the south. And he selected 500 homes in each of those areas, and he matched them based upon past water usage, size of the house, number of people living in their home. 
The other defining characteristic of those three groups of homes is that they all had their use of water monitored through a flow meter. So if you imagine the water pipe that services a neighborhood, Glenn puts a meter on that pipe. They're not measuring the water usage of any one particular household, but they've shut off all the other pipes into that neighborhood. So they can unobtrusively measure people's water usage for both pre-test, post-test measurements, and they can measure this for as long as they like going forward. So 500 homes each. We can compare information intensive approaches, mailing outs that go out to people's homes, versus household visits where they talk to people about reducing their water usage. So what did they do in the information intensive campaign? These people get two mailings over the course of the summer to let them know what kinds of actions they can engage in to reduce their outdoor water usage. And one of those mailings includes a rain gauge, the kind of traditional thing that many municipalities engage in. In contrast, in the other two communities, this is Durham region and Halton region, there are students in Durham region who are going to door, go door to door and speak to people about the importance of them reducing the water usage. And these conversations take about 10 minutes per household for people to engage in. At the very end of the conversation, they ask them to make a commitment. And the commitment sticker is on the left hand side. In a real life, it's about this big. And they ask them to put it in the front window of their home. It's not a good idea. It's durable, but it's not public. If it's out at the curbside, it can be seen by other people. In this case, someone would have to be right on the front doorstep with good eyesight looking at the right place to see the thing. The other aspect of this program, though, was a prompt. And this is a piece of plastic that's hung over their outside water faucet. We know that prompts to be effective need to be close in space and time to behavioral change that we're trying to foster. So it's hung over the outside faucet. Results? Again, this data is all unobtrusive. In North York, which is the information intensive campaign, they get a 1% reduction in water usage as a result of sending out those two mailings over the course of the summer. In contrast, in Durham region, where students went door to door, they get a 32% reduction in outdoor water usage. In Halton region, where staff go door to door, they get a 45% reduction in water usage. Now, we don't know if the difference between Halton and Durham is a student versus staff difference or a community difference. We'd have to switch them around to find which is which. But the important question is, is this cost effective? So what they said is, let's look at what it would cost us to build a new water treatment plant for each of those three regional governments. And is it more cost effective to go after water efficiency using traditional information intensive campaigns or using community-based social marketing? And here's the answer. In North York, the information intensive approach is so grossly ineffective, it's more cost effective for you to build a water plant. In contrast, in Durham region and in Halton region, and this is really a point you're making about return on investment. In each of those cases, even though the program costs more to deliver, it's far more cost effective than building the plant. So we have to look not just at the cost of delivering the program, we have to look obviously what's a return on investment. In terms of a checklist for thinking about making use of prompts, they need to be noticeable. They also interestingly need to be self-explanatory. And that's not true with many of the prompts that are out there. We often have to rely upon mass media campaigns behind the prompts that we're utilizing for people to understand what it is that they're supposed to do when they see this symbol. So we want it to be noticeable, we want it to be self-explanatory, we want it to be close in space and time with the behavioral change, and we want to prompt, whenever possible, beneficial behaviors. We do not want to tell people, whenever possible, what not to do. And the reason for that is whenever we tell someone not, not what not to do, we're educating them about inappropriate behaviors. In California, they have this poster, and I wish I could have it here to show it to you, but it's a poster of what not to do with used motor oil. One of the things on that poster is pouring motor oil over weeds to kill weeds. As a result of doing this, there's a whole bunch of more people in California pouring motor oil over weeds because they didn't realize beforehand you could kill weeds using motor oil. We want to be careful about utilizing prompts around negative behaviors. Lastly, last tool, norms. When we think about norms, again, we're thinking about trying to motivate action. And I want to give you two quick examples of case studies related to you making use of norms. This first example is really interesting. It's hard for me to imagine that Elliot Aronson, who did this research, actually got this through ethics at the University of California, Santa Cruz. He's standing in the men's shower room at the athletic facility one day, and he notices that there's a new sign on the wall, and the sign says, please turn the water off while you soap yourself up, and then turn the water back on to rinse yourself off. And he looks around, and he realizes that no one's paying attention to the sign. 
So he wonders, could it be possible that I could use norms in order to be able to facilitate or make it more likely that people would actually turn off the water? Now think of this from an ethical perspective. If you're going to measure behavior unobtrusively, you're going to either have to videotape new people showering, or you're going to have, to someone have, have someone standing outside the shower room watching all these new people showering. This would never get through ethics in Canada. But this is California. <laughs> Imagine on top of this what the job description will look like if you're a confederate in this. <laughs> Your job is going to be to stand in the shower and shower and shower and shower waiting for someone to come along basically, right? Literally turning into a human prune while you're waiting for some other person to come in the shower. So here's what we get if we have just a sign by itself. We get 6% of people to actually turn the water off. Prompts don't matter when people are not motivated to engage in behavioral change, right? Again, Motivation trumps barriers. We need to find ways to motivate people first. If you have just one person in the shower modeling the behavior, 49% of people then turn off the water. Remarkable findings. Two people doing this, it goes up to 67%. We have no reason to believe just based upon this one exposure, and I mean that literally and figuratively. We have no reason to believe based upon this one exposure that people are going to then subsequently go off in the privacy of their own homes and turn the water off. But if they see behaviors like this in the real world numerous times, that's how we begin to go from descriptive norms, which this is an example of, to personal norms, and then eventually to injunctive norms, where people are telling someone, your behavior is not acceptable. You're smoking in a public space in which other people are sharing the air. That's not acceptable. Descriptive to personal to injunctive. Now, we need to be really careful when we make use of descriptive norms. When we're making use of descriptive norms, we want to make sure that we're not showcasing inappropriate behavior. And this is a wonderful example of this. This is the Petrified National Forest in the southwest part of the United States. And for years, they've had a particular problem. People go to the Petrified National Forest to see rocks like this that millions of years ago were trees. And you can literally see the rings in some of these rocks. And it's such an amazing thing to see and there's virtually no one else around, that they take little artifacts from the park. The park is losing, on average, 2 million pounds of rock a year from the park. So it's literally beginning to disappear. For years, the wardens have been trying to get people to stop doing this. Here's a sign that they use. Many past visitors have removed petrified wood from the park, changing the natural state of the petrified forest. What are they doing? They're saying lots of people do this. What is that? It's a descriptive social norm, but in the wrong direction. So this man, Noah Goldstein, many of you know Bob Cialdini. He's a former PhD student of Bob Cialdini. Noah Goldstein goes to the park with his wife. His wife sees this sign. She's there to help him with putting this project in place. She takes him aside and says, we need to take some. If we don't do that, it's all going to be gone soon. Right? <laughs> These are the very people who are there to try to make sure that this doesn't happen. So they have a second sign. The second sign is injunctive. It says nothing about the number of people doing this. It just says it's not approved of. So what do they do? Beautiful, small little field experiment. They take a number of different trails in the park, and they randomly sign one of these two different signs to it. They then mark up a whole bunch of different pieces of rock, and they put them back where they were found, and they create basically a rock map for the park and they go away for five weeks. They come back five weeks later, and they look to see how many of these pieces of rock were stolen over the course of those five weeks based upon whether people saw the descriptive social norm, the top message, or the injunctive social norm, the bottom message. And here are the results. When they see the descriptive social norm, the one that's approving of the behavior because lots of other people are doing this, nearly one out of 10 pieces of rock were stolen over the course of just five weeks. In contrast, when they see the injunctive social norm, it's just a quarter of that. It's a remarkable difference for just changing the wording on the particular sign. So here's a checklist for thinking about the utilization of norms. We want to highlight the large number of people who are engaged in behavior change that we're trying to foster. That's a descriptive social norm. If you don't have the behavior yet, then what we'd like to do in its place is highlight the large number of people who approve of the behavior. So I've delivered anti-idling programs in cities in which we have not delivered the program yet, 
But we've done survey research that demonstrates that nearly nine out of 10 people believe it's important to turn their engines off. That's what we advertise across the community. Nearly 90% of people believe it's important to turn your engine off to improve air quality. Next, don't advertise wrongdoing. We want to be very careful about advertising wrongdoing because we can be facilitating the behavior. And then use referent groups. This is a really interesting application of social psychological knowledge. This is OPower. If any of you are not familiar with OPower, OPower has picked up on the research that a colleague and friend of mine, Wes Schultz, has done. Wes demonstrated in a project in San Diego that if you provided people with descriptive normative information about their energy use in their home relative to what neighbors around them were doing, you could get significant reductions in energy use. We now have some 30 million households in the United States alone that are getting descriptive social norm information and they're getting significant reductions in people's energy use by seeing the comparison between what they're using and what other people around them, their referent group, are using. Now, what you need to be careful of and what you might wish to write down about this is what's called a magnetic middle effect. With a magnetic middle effect, those people who are doing better than average, if you don't socially approve of what they're doing, they return to average, they regress back to the mean. Where we see the change happening often is that people are using worse than average, they do better. But if you put a smiley face, something literally as you know, small as a smiley face on the feedback, the people are doing better than average, stay where they are. Now this was first done on energy, it's now being done on water and a whole variety of other types of behavioral changes, where people are using mass mailings at people's homes and we're now beginning to see it showing up literally in energy monitors, where you're getting on an energy monitor through smart re meters feedback about what you're utilizing versus what other people in your direct neighborhood are utilizing. Really interesting application of descriptive and adjunctive social norms. Here's a much less expensive way to do some of this. This is a project that I've been working on in England. We want people in a very um, non-affluent part of England to install water-saving devices in the back of the toilet. These are called save flushes You put it back in the toilet, it expands and reduces the water for every subsequent flush. They're giving these things away for free, and we want to make sure that people are actually going to put them in. So when the person is being given one, they say to them, would you be willing to make a commitment to install this? And would you just write down on this little 3M note when you plan to do this? So we're getting a public and durable commitment, and we're grouping them together. So people have the sense of lots of people in our community believe this is important to do, and people are writing down when they plan to do it. Most people are saying, I'll either do it today or I'll do it in the next day. We're getting over 80% of people to put those things in almost right away. Just a small combination of commitments combined with implementation intentions is getting large numbers of people to engage in this. So finally, let me conclude or finish off with a set of recommendations. First of all, oh, by the way, this transition, it took me half a day to learn that transition, all right? It took two and a half seconds, but it took me half a day to learn how to do that. First of all, rigorously select the behaviors. We want to make use of impact, probability, and penetration to cull a long list of potential behaviors down to a shorter list. Secondly, we want to identify the barriers and benefits for those specific actions and make sure that our programs are based upon good core knowledge about what those barriers and benefits are. Again, we tend not to see a consistent set of barriers and benefits across actions. We want to select our tools based upon what we learn from the barrier and benefit research and make sure that we're thinking about are we using commitments, norms, et cetera, in the appropriate ways based upon the social science literature in this area. And then finally, we want to not eat a partner's chocolate. Okay. Thank you very much for your afternoon.